Welcome back to track one, everyone. I hope you all had a cup of coffee and you're feeling a little bit more awake. Um, your next speaker is an old friend, Kieran McNulty. Um, Kieran helps teams of all levels and abilities improve uh, via training and coaching. He's the lead maintainer of PHP Spec, um, and he's also a new father as well. So please give him a big round of applause to wake him up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Kieran McNulty. Thanks, everyone. I was up at one o'clock this morning. So, uh, if I fall asleep mid-talk, please forgive me. Yes? How new of a father are you? Oh, she's seven months. Okay. It's not that new, but I'm near enough that I can come to conferences now. Um, so, I'm going to talk about BHAP best practices, and um, kind of spoiler alert, the best practice uh, is to do BDD, which is Behaviour Driven Development. So, BHAP is a particular tool, and you can use it for different things. You can use it for different types of testing, um, but it's designed for use in, in a behaviour-driven development life cycle. So I'm going to start by talking about BDD, then show some examples of once you've started doing BDD, how you integrate BHAT into that. I'm kind of half expecting more people to come in because there's at least two people said they were coming and every other talk has been interrupted. So we'll just bear with that as we go. So when we're developing software, there's a kind of journey involved. So we start off with some kind of business problems. We want more customers, we want to sell more stuff, or you know, we want to make more profit from the stuff we're selling, that kind of thing. It doesn't have to be financial, but often is. And uh, so to be able to solve these business problems, we have to have, uh, at some point, a discussion Outside of development, perhaps, a wider discussion about how is our business going to solve these problems. So what rules are we going to put in? What policies are we going to put in? What areas of activity are we going to start doing that we don't do yet? And in a lot of organisations, the IT team aren't involved in this conversation yet. In some organisations, they're very much part of this conversation. And then sort of towards the end, we're going to implement these rules in software. We're going to enable people to do things they couldn't do before by building software. And this is where we start becoming quite specific in our technical solutions. Often this is where we're narrowing down our choices. And this is where we come up with things like the code we're writing. It's also where we come up with things like the exact user interface we're going to use, the database schemas we're going to use, make architectural decisions. But this is all later. So some teams only get involved here. It's generally a good idea to try and get yourself involved as far left as possible uh, to have the biggest impact, for the technology to have the biggest impact. And this journey of thinking about problems, thinking about solutions, and then thinking about technology, this is where BDD uh, comes in. So this was uh, coined by a guy called Dan North. Um, who was doing test-driven development. And he, he kind of rephrased some of the aspects of test-driven development as behaviour-driven development to make it more understandable to people. So Dan's sort of big idea at that point, he's had lots of ideas since, was instead of telling people the first thing we're going to do is write a test, Liz has entered the room on the, just before the slide she's in, uh, <laughs> Dan said, uh, instead of calling it a test and saying to people, write a test first, let's call it a specification or a spec or a description, maybe it's better, a description of what the system's going to do. And it's going to be more understandable to people to say, the first thing we do is we write a description of what we're going to build, and then we write some code, and then we check it's correct. That's maybe more understandable than write a test first. So behaviour-driven development is about behaviour. Liz Keogh, who's keynoting in the next slot, um, has my preferred definition. It's when you use examples in conversations to illustrate behaviour. So there's three sort of important aspects there. The first bit is you're having conversations. So it's a t technique that applies when you're able to have conversations about how the system should behave uh, as far left as you can on that previous diagram. So we're not having descriptions really about the technology or the implementation. Um, 
we're having conversations about what's the overall behavior of the system. You can apply BDD te techniques lower down, but in the context of BHAT, we're normally talking about when we're building a feature, what's it going to do? Can I talk to someone about how it's going to behave? Is it a conversation? Or is it someone dumps requirements on me from over a wall? So BDD, you need to have conversations. The conversations have to be about the behavior of the system. I'll talk a bit about what my understanding of behavior is. And very crucially, you have these conversations by talking about examples. By giving examples. So what, what's an example? An example is something that serves to illustrate or explain a rule. So in BDD, we talk a lot about examples. It's not that we're obsessed with examples, or we want them for their own end, maybe. It's that examples are a great way for humans to make sure they're understanding the rules correctly. So if you, know, if you don't understand something, you often ask for an example. Or if you're explaining something, you often give an example. So really, it's to kind of, these business solutions we're coming up with, we're making sure we all understand them by giving examples. In this situation, this is what's going to happen. So here's an example of a business rule. We charge our customers sales tax at a rate of 20%. Um, you can argue that some rules are really simple, really trivial, and kind of obvious, easy to understand. You can read it and you just immediately understand it. Who thinks they understand the business rule? Uh, a lot of you know that these are often a trap. <laughs> um, so even with a simple rule, it's worth having a conversation. And you might say, OK, give me an example of, of how that kind of thing works. Just, it's only going to take a second. Just tell me how it works. So what you're saying is, if an item's priced at $10, we're going to charge $10 and $2 tax for a total of $12. Is that what everyone understood? Who's lying? The point of an example is, when one person's describing something to another person, and they're just thinking about rules, it's really hard to explain a rule. Rules are like algorithms. There's loads of possible inputs. There's loads of possible outputs. Um, so to make... And really what we're trying to check is, does the mental model of one person match the mental model of another person? That's really hard to check without telepathy. So if you're just expressing yourself in rules, this person can explain something, this person thinks they understand it, but they haven't quite got what the other person's talking about. They've got a kind of competing understanding. And it's very hard to detect. If the first person gives some examples, you can kind of run these examples, in this case, this is what will happen, through your mental model, and start to realize, actually, I, I didn't quite understand it correctly. We're talking about different things. It's not that this person's wrong. It's not a one-way conversation. It's just you're detecting we're not talking about the same thing. Maybe they're talking about it this way. That would, that would fit all of the examples they gave me. I'll give some examples back, and this will give this person confidence. OK, we're on, we're on the same wavelength. We've given some concrete cases, and we both agree that's what would happen in different situations. It's really likely that we've got the same understanding. So in this situation, I had a simple rule, and I gave an example. It gives the other person the opportunity to say, no, that's not how it works. It's not how it works here, where we are today. What happens is, if an item's priced at £10, we charge £10. It's just that we remember, retrospectively, some of that was sales tax. We have to store that somewhere and pay it at the end of the year to HMRC, which is a very different model. Instead of charging more than the price, we're charging what the price is, and we're doing some accounting stuff. So even with a very simple rule, giving an example gives the other person the opportunity to say, that's not quite how I understood it. Can we talk more about it? So one way of thinking about behavior is, you know, what, what's the input? What are the rules? We're going to run it through the rules that we have in our head. And then what's the output? It's hard to talk about the rules, but we can quite easily talk about inputs and outputs. So when this thing happens, then this other thing should happen. And we check, we all agree. Um, People often use the keywords when and then. This is a talk about BHAT, so I'm going to start formalizing the language a bit early. 
But you don't get obsessed with these keywords when you're talking to humans. You get obsessed with the keywords when you start talking to computers. Uh, I'm, I'm introducing them a bit now, but what's the thing that's going to happen? What's the outcome going to be? I'm going to buy a pair of brand name jeans. I should probably charge them for free advertising. Um, and I'm going to get charged this price. But there is something missing from this description of the system. There's some there's another element, which is why, why am I getting charged that price for that product? There's some kind of state. So there's a context. When I'm in a particular situation, when this input happens, then this output's going to happen. So use the keyword given. Given Levo 501s have been listed at this price in our system, when I buy Levo 501s, I'm going to get charged 32.99. So it's good to audit these things for understandability. Is it really clear why that input leads to this output? So once you've, got, ooh, once you've had a few conversations, you've come up with a few examples, there are some uh, sort of avenues you can go down, and these are stolen from Liz's blog. Um, one is the context. Make, ask questions about the context. So you said in this situation, when this happens, this should happen. Is there any other context that would mean a different thing happened? So in our example, I'm buying a pair of jeans and I'm charged 3299. Is there any situation where I'd buy these jeans and pay a different amount? Or not be able to buy them? Yeah. So you're having this conversation with someone. Maybe it's someone who represents the business. Maybe you've got the QA team in there. It depends on your context. What else could happen? We're using real examples, we're using real products and real prices. It's quite easy for someone to then think, OK, there's lots of other stuff that could happen. Um, maybe things are going to be on sale. Maybe things are ex-display or damaged, so they cost less. Maybe I'm a member of staff, so I don't have to pay as much. So you're discovering a whole load of potential things we could build into the system in future. You're discovering new business rules that we might want to add. <coughs> And you're probably having a conversation around that um, about which ones are we going to do now. So if you're talking about, if you're, if you're applying this kind of process at the feature level and you're talking about a user story, you often uncover a load of things they thought they were getting <laughs> that they're not. <laughs> or you can have a constructive conversation like, in our next release, in our next sprint, which, which of these things have to be supported, if any? Or can we defer them all till later? So questioning the context is very powerful. Uh, another avenue to go down is to question the outcome and say, OK, when that event happens, you've told me one, one outcome. Is there other stuff that also happens that's quite important? Um, I buy the pair of jeans. I'm charged money. What else happens? Is there anything else happen that, that we need to care about in this situation? Well. I get given a pair of jeans. There has to be something integrating with the dispatch process, or maybe the warehouse needs to be told to send a product to someone. Um, we have to say there's one less pair of jeans in the warehouse in that size. There's other things that happen as a result. <clears throat> and to be honest, this is most useful when teams are focusing a bit too much on the user feedback. So sometimes you'll see when I buy a pair of Levi jeans, I get told, congratulations, you've got a pair of jeans, and people aren't really thinking, what's the actual system doing? We're not thinking really about the UI. We're thinking, what are the rules? What needs to happen now inside the system as a result of this event? So overall, um, that's a very quick description of EDD, full of holes. The thing is about focusing on conversations. It's not a one-way flow in a business where someone writes this sort of thing and drops it on your desk and you go away and program. A lot of the practice is in building communication inside teams, between, teams and Q, uh, between development, developers and QA inside teams, um, building communication with business stakeholders, getting past your product owner and finding the interesting people, that kind of process, and kind of becoming engaged in asking, actively asking questions. This kind of communi communication works best in real life uh, with other humans, uh, live, real-time talking to people, uh, and not really focusing on this structure 
writing it down like this later if you're going to use it to automate. But talking to people, giving examples, saying, agreeing between yourselves, what should we build next? And how will it behave? So BDD is not really about testing. That bit so far is the bulk of BDD. We're going to talk about testing. <laughs> Um, so testing is a bit of BDD. BDD is a kind of high automation uh, practice in that most of the people practicing BDD are developers, uh, or at least technically inclined people. And so it's not really about requirement capture. It's not about writing these, having a conversation, writing these things, and then treating it as a contract we all wrote in blood for something we're going to build in six months. You know? it's, about, it's about a format for having conversations with people about what we're going to build. But it is a bit about testing. It came from the world, you know, BDD community grew out of the world of TDD, ATDD. Um, we're in tr the outputs of this process are that everyone understands what they're going to be building. Everyone understands the business rules behind it. Everyone understands why they're building it and who they're building it for. And also, as a nice coincidence, we've written out a load of cases of exactly how the system should behave in different situations. And someone who is uh, technically minded will look at that and say, how can I automate that check those tests to check the system actually does those things? Because otherwise, we're going to have to pay someone to manually check the system does all of those things, and that sounds inefficient. So the examples are so that we understand the business rules. When we build the technical solutions, we're probably going to write some tests. Ho hopefully we're going to write some tests. Right, everyone? Or at least manually test it. And so there's a natural parallel between a bunch of specific cases with real values that we came up with when we were doing this so we understood the rules, and a bunch of tests, which are a set of specific examples with specific values of how the system behaves in specific situations. And this bridge is where tooling like BAT came into the picture. But you don't have to automate everything. We write examples for all the things that are interesting to talk about when we're trying to understand what we're going to build and we test a lot of stuff, and there's going to be some overlap where we want to test at that kind of acceptance test level, the requirement level. We want a test that's patterned after that, and it's something we talked about. This is a good candidate for the one thing to drive the other. BHAT was developed by Konstantin Kudryashov. Um, it was uh, inspired by Cucumber. <laughs> So it's basically a version of Cucumber that works in PHP and is written in PHP. And Cucumber is a tool that will take a written description, a slightly formalized description of an example, and help you automate tests against it. It's not worth using if you just want to write some tests and you're never going to speak to anyone, because you're going to have to write them all out in English first and then write automation code. You're probably better off writing automation code. And just because you've had a conversation about something doesn't mean you need to automate it. But there is a very rich area here, and that's what the rest of the talk is about. So once you've, got a, once you've had the conversation, once you've bit, written out a bunch of examples, there's a language you can transpose them into called Gherkin. This is the point where you start adding that given when then thing. Really don't worry about it up till then. And let's zoom in a little bit. The top of the file starts with feature. You describe what it is. You can give a bit of free text description of the feature. That's just for other people to read, other developers. Uh, in a few years' time, they're going to come along and wonder what this thing's supposed to do. And it's a good place to document the rules. And so in this example, I do training for a living, one of the things I do. And when you're scheduling a training course that people can sign up to, one of the problems is that you might not get enough people, and then you're left doing a training course for two people, and it's a waste of your time. But you have to do it anyway, because you're a nice guy. Um, or you might have way too many people, and you probably should have split them into different dates, that kind of thing. So the rules of this simple system are, 
when I propose a course, I'm going to have some size limits for that particular course. When enough people have enrolled, the course is then viable and I'm happy going ahead with the course. Uh, when we've hit the maximum class size, we're not going to let anyone else sign up to the course. Pretty simple, some business constraints. Um, I would say in a real system, you might not want to ban people from signing up, you might want to talk about it instead, but this is what we're going to go through. So some examples of how this will behave. Um, we write out scenarios, but we can have a background which is sort of things that are true for all of the examples we're going to give. So in every example, there's a course called BDD for Beginners that's proposed with a class size of two to three people. I should probably have more realistic class sizes. And one example of how it might behave is um, if only Alice enrolls on the course, then the course isn't viable. Makes sense, I hope. And I give it a title. The course doesn't get enough enrolments to be viable. That's just a description of like what's the general case I'm trying to illustrate with this specific example. Um, another scenario, the course does get enough enrolments. So remember it's two to three people. If, if Alice has already enrolled on the course, when Bob enrolls on the course, then the course will be viable. And the only other thing I can think of it stops when the class size is reached. So if Alice, Bob and Charlie have already enrolled on the course, when Derek tries to enrol on the course, he shouldn't be able to enrol. They're very simple scenarios, but they kind of illustrate all three business rules. I don't think we need any more for people to understand what the rules are. So the job of um, BHAT is to tie these uh, English steps into automation code that I'm going to write. So that's kind of all it does. It handles parsing this, this Gherkin syntax, and then it matches, for every line in the, in the feature description, a piece of PHP code that I can execute that will check the behavior of the system. So I've got a bunch of feature files. This is a feature file. Each one of these is called a step. For every step, it will try and find a method to execute. And I, I can have multiple classes with different methods in. I won't go into the details of how that's configured yet. But uh, it, the same steps might match the same, different steps might match the same method in the class, so our code can be reusable. But I have to write the actual test code. So we're going to step through the scenarios, and for each step, I'll show the code that, that we'd write that would automate the test. So when I have a line in the Gherkin that says something like given a thing happens to Kieran, I've got a function in PHP annotated with a pattern that matches the step. This is what's going to get executed. I have to write the test's code. This is a pretty simple syntax with placeholders. So this will match any string that says a thing happens to and then some name. Um, and the way users tend to interact with the system is through the user interface. Often we're in PHP, especially we're building web interfaces. But hopefully your system has some sort of architecture uh, underneath. It might not, in which case you'll have to do everything for your UI, but it might be we can apply these tests lower down, lower down in the stack. So we're going to start by automating the domain model. So I've got a kind of three-layer approach. I'm going to have a bunch of objects that do the work. I'm going to have a bunch of services that coordinate how those objects talk. And then at the end, I'm going to have a user interface which shows people web pages. They can click on it. Starting at the bottom is a very powerful technique. So it's going to drive the PHP objects inside my domain model directly. Um, it's going to prove that those objects are capable of doing all the things in, in the requirements, all the things we agreed the system could do. So kind of proving that the core domain model can do it, even if it's got a different user interface. That's quite important. It's going to align the domain model with the business language. We'll talk a bit more about that. It's going to execute very quickly, because we're just going to be instantiating a bunch of objects. 
Now this is slightly different to unit testing um, because we're assuming that this kind of test, it's aligned with these little scenarios that we wrote, which are part of the requirements of the system. So it's kind of like an acceptance test. It might involve multiple objects to achieve this functionality. Um, if you have one big object that does the whole thing, it'll look a lot like a unit test. But hopefully you've got nice small objects that you assemble together. So if I run the tool, it'll complain. It'll say, I don't know what to do for any of these steps. They get colored in yellow. So I step through, I start at the top and I say, okay, I need to tell BHAT what to do for this step. So the first step is given BDD for beginners was proposed with the class size of two to three people. I have to tell BHAT what that's going to mean in our system. This is a system we haven't built yet. So I try and type this in as PHP as closely as I feel like I can make it. I want my domain model to be aligned with the language I use to talk to people. So I put a pattern that's going to match this step. Uh, the title and the minimum and maximum are going to get fed through as arguments because they're placeholders. And then I just say, okay, uh, there's going to be an object called a course. It gets proposed. It has a title. And it also has a class size, which gets constructed between a minimum and a maximum number. Right? So I'm kind of designing the system from the outside in. When I execute it, I get a fatal error because none of these objects exist. I made them up at this point. So I'm then going to go and create those objects. I would probably write unit tests for them as part of my workflow of building these objects. But I'm basically making objects that are able to do this thing. So I have to have a course that can be proposed. I have to have a class size that's between a minimum and a maximum. Once I've made all those objects, that step starts to pass because it executes correctly. All the things exist. I'm skipping the TDD bit, the unit test bit for time, uh, but it, for me, it's quite an important part of the process. So then I look at the next step. Only Alice enrolls on the course. I'm going to write a method. Only someone enrolls on the course, and I'm going to, the object I just created, I'm going to call its enroll method. Um, obviously, this is a string in the Gherkin, Alice. So there's a feature called a transform. I can write something that turns it from a string into an object. I'll, I'm going to have a learner object. Makes sense to me. And the course can enroll a learner. Uh, again, as soon as I execute this, it's going to fail because this method doesn't exist, this object doesn't exist. I'll then go and write a learner object, and I'll add an enroll method to the course. The next step the course will not be viable. So in the then steps, this is where you have to kind of check something. Then is saying the outcome is going to be. So you have to implement a test. Um, BHAT will pass a step as long as an exception isn't thrown. So I just have to throw an exception if it's not true. Here I'm using PHP's assert. Um, you can use any assertion library. You can use the PHP unit assertions. Um, there's a bunch of other good assertion libraries. People use Hamcrest and things like that. Anything that lets you check stuff. So here I'm saying the course is, is viable method is going to return false. When I run this, it will break because there's no is viable method. I need to make one and I need to make sure it returns false. And then I've kind of finished my first scenario and I've fleshed out a lot of the system. I now know there's like a learner object, a course object. Learners can enroll on the course. You can ask the course, is this course viable yet? So I've kind of fleshed out a lot of the uh, API. And you find the first scenario, you're often having to make, make a lot of stuff. And the next scenarios will just be adding to that model. So the next scenario was um, the course gets enough and it suddenly becomes viable. So Alice has already enrolled on this course. I already have a step that enrolls people that matched the previous thing. I can add another pattern that matches the same thing. So I'm kind of reusing the code. Second scenario is going to be a bit quicker to implement. So I wrote this for the first scenario, and now I'm just saying it also matches this step. And Bob enrolls on the course. That, that also matches this step, because it's just a step that enrolls people. I can 
make the only keyword here optional. The previous one was Alice enrolls on the course. This one is, sorry, the previous one was only Alice enrolls on the course, and this one is Bob enrolls on the course. So making only optional means both steps match this method. The course will be viable, so I need to tell B how, how do you check a course is viable. You assert that is viable returns true. And now it breaks, but it breaks in a different way. It's not a syntax error, it's that the logic isn't true. I haven't implemented the logic. So in the first scenario, all courses weren't viable. Now I have to write some logic that says when enough people have signed up, the course becomes viable. So I have to go to the course object, write some logic here that delegates to a value object, my class size. I have to add some stuff here. I need to do a bit of TDD. But I can quite quickly get everything passing. So the last scenario is too many people tried to sign up. So I've got, given Alice, Bob and Charlie have already enrolled on this course, I'll write a step that takes three people and enrolls them all. There is a thing you can do with a table, but for three it's all right. When Derek tries to enroll on this course, notice that I didn't have to add anything to the model here. Like it's an extra scenario, but I'm not having to add methods because it's, the model's maturing a bit. We need a method where someone tries to enroll, so we'll say, I have to think what's failing to enroll going to be like. Failing to enroll is going to be that the course throws an exception saying you can't enroll. So I'll write something that tries to enroll and then catches any exceptions. And then to check that he, you couldn't enroll, I check that an exception was thrown by the previous step. This is a bit tricky because the steps are executed distinctly, but I'm catching the exception in one in one step, and in the next step I'm saying the exception should be there. This isn't implemented yet, so I get a logic error. And then I have to go and add this code that checks the class size and throws the exception if it's too big. And then I've kind of got everything green and I feel a bit more confident about my system. So I've built a course object, which is like an entity changes its state over time, people enrolled on it, people unenroll. I've built a kind of value object that's a learner, and I've built a value, value object that's a class size. So I've kind of fleshed out my domain model. All the way through, I was using the words from the scenarios to name methods, to name classes, and this means that those objects that I've created, they're very closely aligned with the way people talk about the business, and this is a in domain-driven design, this is called ubiquitous language. The idea is the naming from the way, from a conversation I had with business people has now kind of made its way into my domain model. This makes it more likely my domain model is going to be the right shape for future changes in the business, or at least it matches the way the business people think about things. So I do this kind of practice when I'm trying to generate a domain model that matches a good conversation I had. A lot of the model's been generated in the conversation. I'm trying to translate it into PHP. I often drive at this level when it's something new or something novel that I'm trying to figure out how it's going to work. So let's look at another level of testing. Um, I can use the same, because those scenarios are written just in business terms, I can use the same scenarios to test at different levels. And I, I would say instead of not as well as at the domain model. Instead, I might choose to test at the service layer. So if you think about a kind of hexagonal architecture or clean architecture, I've got a core domain model. I maybe don't want all of my user interface to, domain, to rely directly on those objects, because then when I realize I've got a better idea for how the system should work and try and refactor the domain model, I have to go and find all of the parts of the user interface that are using them. There's a dependency there. So an application service layer is a good way of decoupling the way your user interface uses your domain model from the details of the, of the domain model. It's useful in cases where you think the domain model is going to evolve over time. So to drive the service layer, I need to configure the services in a test environment. I need to inject the services into BHAP. This is if 
If I'm configuring the services using a dependency injection container, which is a very common use case, I would need to inject the services into a BHAP context. You don't have to do that. You might have factories and other ways of building your services. But I'm going to show how you do it with sort of common frameworks. Because you might lean on the framework for configuring your services. And then instead of driving the domain model, I'm going to drive the service layer, and the service layer is going to drive the domain model. So the same domain model, I'm going to refactor to this. When we were driving the domain model directly, we were making sure the domain model supported all of the use cases from the business, and that the domain model kind of reflected the model that existed in the scenarios. By driving the service layer, we're going to be a bit more abstract. We're checking that the system as a whole, this core, supports the use cases. Uh, it's not going to give us any pressure to make the objects in the domain model look like the language, but it's going to make sure we have like an API that supports the different use cases the business has. That sounds complicated, but hopefully it's a bit clearer. Um, BHAT has, BHA has this context of suites. So suites let you automate the same scenarios against different sets of test automation code. So in this case, I'm going to give it the domain context that I just wrote that has all the steps that match the domain model. It's also going to run the same features against the service context. So it's going to run through the domain context, and the way this is configured, it would run both. It'll test it once inside the core domain model and once on the outside of the service layer. In real life, you might not do both for the same features. So to test at the service layer, I'm going to go through the scenarios again. But this is in a different context class. I have to tell BHAT how to test the same features in a, in a different way, at a different level. So the first step we did last time, given the course was proposed with a class size of two to three people, uh, is, yes? Is it the same feature file? Same feature file, yeah. So this, the, the same feature file gets run at, at the two different, different levels. Uh, so instead of driving the objects directly, we're assuming we've got an a service called course enrollments. Um, when, a class, when a course was proposed with the class size of min to max people, I just translate that into a call on this service with the title and the minimum and the max. And I'm not using any value objects here. I want the service API to be very... Uh, to not rely on the domain model at all. I want to be able to change the domain model and this is how we use the services. So where does the service come from? It's given to the constructor of the BHAT context by BHAT. And to get it in there, you need to use an extension. So in the Symfony extension, you turn on Symfony extension, and then you tell it this context gets uh, instantiated with this Symfony service. If you're using a different framework, and it's one that supports uh, PSR 11. You can pretty much plug any framework into it um, as long as someone's written an extension. So I helped, um, I slightly helped James uh, write this Rove PSR 11 extension. That means any framework that uses the PSR 11 standard for service containers, you can plug them into BHAT. This is specifically for Zend. Uh, and there's some new features that I haven't used much, but essentially there's some movement in BHAT so we can auto-wire these things. So that configuration, it might be that in a couple of versions of the extension, we can get rid of it and just type hint the services we want in the constructor of the, of the uh, BHAT context. That's not quite working yet because we have to integrate it with every single framework. This is if you want to configure your services in your framework's test environment, and then test them using BHAT. If you don't want to use a service container, it's easier. You just write factories, or builders, or any other pattern that constructs services, and you just use them directly inside BHAT. So I have to write a service. In this case, I might write my course enrollment service. When you propose a course, it's going to use the domain model to propose the course. So this is assuming I've already written the domain model. 
So just to show that again, b hat is going to call this propose method, which is deliberately kept very simple API. And then I write a service that has that, um, that API that uses the domain models. And I've introduced a repository here. I need to add to the list of courses. So what this does, testing at the domain level, applied a bit of pressure on the naming. It applied a bit of pressure on, you know, it makes it much more natural for my objects to reflect the sentences. What this level of testing, testing against the service layer does, is it makes sure I have an API that's named similarly to the steps that supports business use cases. So if you consider a domain model wrapped in a service layer, we're kind of providing an API to that service layer that directly corresponds with the steps in the scenarios. And, it, and what that means is it directly corresponds with the things people want to do, the use cases of the system. So we've now got a, a service that lets you propose a course. Uh, and that is what you would call from your UI. Your controller would just say, course enrollments, propose a new course, not worry about persistence and all that stuff. That's hidden in the service. So obviously, it makes it easier to change the UI or add a command line application or things like that, add a REST API. So I've introduced infrastructure here by having a courses repository. That's probably going to connect to a database. Um, using a real database is generally slow. But if you use fake infrastructure, you're, you have this funny feeling in the back of your head that maybe it won't work with a real database. Um, so you can either just use the real database and take the enormous pain that's involved with slow tests and having to restore the state of the database and things. Or you can kind of split the problem in two and say, we're going to use fake infrastructure when we're testing the core. But we're going to check that the fake infrastructure matches the real infrastructure. So imagine I have a place to store users um, that can save, uh, probably should have a user in there, uh, and can find users by email. And I've got an implementation that uses my ORM to store them in a real database. And the ORM has its own abstractions inside it that lets me talk to multiple databases. So I write this implementation that talks to Doctrine. But for my tests, I might be happy just having a, a version of that infrastructure that just saves users in memory in an, in an array or a hash or whatever, or puts them on a little file in the temp folder, up to you. So how do I make sure that my fake is behaving the same way my real one does? Well, this is one way. It uses inheritance, which kind of sucks, but it fits nicely with PHP unit. Um, so I define a test for my real infrastructure. And I, maybe I write some tests. And it has a setup and a teardown. So the setup sets up a real database, a real test database. And the teardown deletes the test database. But then I put the tests up here in an abstract test. You could use composition instead. It's probably better. But this, this is kind of a natural way of doing it. So the test is here. And the test should only use these methods. Um, and then I can write an in-memory test that I can set up and tear down that runs the same tests. So we're kind of checking the fake behaves the same, the database behaves correctly, the fake behaves the same as the database. So now I have confidence that if I use the fake in my acceptance tests, it'll probably work with the database. Right? So you can be really naive in your implementation of the in-memory ones. This is a courses repository. Uh, you can add a course to the list. And then when you find it by title, it returns the only one that's there. So obviously, as, as we have more complicated tests, we might need to make this a bit better. Might need to loop over the array and look at their titles. But you can be, be quite simple about it. And this is going to run in memory. It's not going to hit disk. It's going to make the acceptance test very quick. Um, and I'd need to write a test that checks when I add something and ask to find by title, it gets found. And what's another test I could write? When I add something and ask to find by a different title, nothing comes back. And then I kind of run out of ideas for tests, because adding this interface, this abstraction, really narrows down the variations of what can happen. 
There's all sorts of things can happen in our domain model that use this repository. There's not that many things can happen on the other side of the repository as it talks to infrastructure. So you get another benefit that you're kind of decoupling the variety of different things that can happen inside your infrastructure and the variety of things that can happen inside your domain and service layers. So I'll keep going. What's the next step? Only Alice enrolls on this course. So on my existing service, I'm going to add an enroll method that takes a string and takes the ID of the course we just added. I'm going to have to go off and write an enroll method on the service that delegates to the enroll method on the course. And the course won't be viable, so I'm going to add a method on the service that looks in the, inside the domain model and figures out, is the course viable? So I've added a kind of layer of indirection of services that are, the service layer contains all of the knowledge about how my use cases correspond to my domain model. So you don't have to do this all the time. If you think you've absolutely nailed your domain model and it's a small site, and if you change the domain model, you don't mind change editing all the controllers that directly rely on it, go ahead. This is really useful if you think you're going to next sprint, build some new features that make you change the domain model, and I'm going to realize that I shouldn't have a course object at all. It's going to be something completely different. Because now I have this service layer that's kind of decoupling me. So I tend to start by driving the domain layer, because I feel like it helps me figure out what the model should be. I then probably, when I feel like I've, what is it? When do I do this? It's so when I feel like I've, I've, I'm getting to the end of the use cases, I'm getting to the end of the things people will do, this part of the system for now, I might start testing at the service layer and say, well, let's start concreting that a bit and formalizing the use cases. And if I'm, if I'm remodeling, I'll sometimes go back to driving the domain model directly. I wouldn't keep testing at both levels because it is a bit duplicative. You're checking the same thing at both layers might keep the domain model test, but comment them out or something. So, so finally, the UI. This is where most people use BHAT, and it's probably the worst place to use it, because um, if you're testing at the user interface, you're not helping yourself build the domain model, and you're not helping yourself have a core with a bunch of use cases. But you are checking that the system, the user, in, you know, you are checking that a person can do the things they're supposed to be able to do by clicking on stuff. So that, that is valuable. Um, normally, the best way of doing it is simulating a browser with the BHAT Mink extension uh, to interact with the domain model via the UI. You're checking the UI supports the business use cases. Even if it's got a terrible architecture internally, you're checking the UI supports the business use cases. Um, it's painful. It's going to be slow, especially if you're using a real browser. Um, they'll, they sort of randomly crash sometimes, and things time out, and the web servers kills itself. Um, so it gets flaky. Uh, and it's kind of brittle to UI changes. So when the front end switches to a different CSS framework and they take out all the classes that your um, tests were hooked into, that doesn't help anyone. Um, because often the UI will refresh at a different rate to your business rules. You might change the business rules and keep the UI the same, or you might refresh the UI completely in part of the site, but keep the same business rules. And it doesn't apply, I keep saying pressure, I think I've picked that from that price, but the, the only pressure it's applying is that the, the user interface lets people do what they want to do. It's not helping you out with the rest of the system. Uh, don't do this. So this is a very UI-specific um, test. It's a test. It's not a test that came from a conversation. It's a test that a developer wrote. It's not a bad thing, but if, if, you, if you're capable of writing this bit and this bit, you could probably write that in code instead of writing it in English. You can probably just write a test. You don't need the overhead of writing it out in this funny given when then format with sentences, just so you can do browser automation. 
So Mink is a library that was written for BHAT. It does run independently. You can use it with PHP unit. The idea is to have one API for all of the different ways of automating browsers. Uh, so it supports Selenium. Selenium is a tool for running real browsers and automating them. It also supports things like Goot. Goot is a PHP library that does um, HTTP requests. I think it uses Guzzle and then checks the results. So it's like no JavaScript is going to work, but you can check stuff about static pages. It supports things like BrowserKit. BrowserKit is Symfony's testing framework. So it will um, test your web application without using a web server. It's instantiating the application and instantiating a request and running it and checking things about the response. The point of Mink is that you've got one API across all of these tools. So you can write your browser automation against Mink and then in configuration change whether it's automating a real browser or whether it's just running the application in a thread on your local machine. So in the same way that I had a suite for the domain context and a suite for the service context, I can have a different suite for the end-to-end -end tests, the UI tests. And I can, tag, I can say I'm only going to run the scenarios that are tagged end-to-end. -end. I probably don't want to run all of the scenarios end-to-end. -end. Um, you often find when you're looking at them, there's lots of different cases, and it's the same buttons that would be clicked on in the UI. And it's the same things would be checked in the UI. Uh, for, for example, a shopping basket. There might be lots of different pricing calculations you've written scenarios for, but in all cases, someone's clicking add to basket and then checking the number. So if one of them works in the user interface, they're all going to work if you've tested them lower down. So if you know they all work for the services, what you're testing when you're testing the UI is when someone clicks that button, does it call the right method on the service layer? When that thing's displayed on the screen, is it coming from the service layer? Like, is it all hooked up correctly? Uh, <clears throat> I mentioned the Symfony extension includes the Symfony browser kit driver. There's a two in it because no one thought about forward compatibility, but it works with Symfony 4. Um, it doesn't work with Symfony 1, that's the important thing. Um, I've written an extension for uh, pretty much any PSR 7 supporting framework. I haven't got a lot of feedback about whether it works. Yes, it does work. Thank you, Sam. Um, so, this is you doing the same thing with frameworks that aren't Symfony, uh, using a lot of code from Symfony. So this will test any PSR7 framework like Slim or Zend Expressive or all the others in memory without running a real web server. It makes a PSR7 request, it runs it through your app, it gets a PSR7 response back. That's good enough as long as you believe that PSR7 is a good representation of HTTP. As long as you believe that your framework then outputs it correctly through HTTP, you can cut out all of that network traffic. So what does the BHAT context look like at this level? Um, same steps again. We're going to run the same feature again using a different set of automation, but this time it's going to be UI automation code. Given BDD for beginners was proposed with a class size of two to three people. In the given step, you can cheat and not go through the UI. So in this case, I'm going to call a service that puts, puts a real thing. This is going to be configured with um, a different set of services. They'll talk to a real database, but probably a test database. So this is going to propose a course into my test database. I mean, it's with the when and then that I really focus on the UI. So when Alice enrolls on this course, what does it mean for Alice to enroll on a course through the UI? It means she goes to a page, uh, she fills in the field saying, hello, my name's Alice, and then she clicks enroll. That's what Alice enrolls on the course means. We're not, just because we're testing through the UI doesn't mean we're going to rewrite the scenarios to have loads of UI stuff. The course will not be viable. When I go to the courses page, there's a warning telling me this course isn't viable. So that's how we're kind of plastering over a UI layer to check the same use cases work through the user interface. I'm not going to go into the details of Mink. This could be running a real Firefox popping open and running things against a real web server. It could be running in memory using one of the other drivers. So when you're automating a real browser, try not to. Um, they really, really, really go slowly. 
about at least 100 times slower than a driver like BrowserKit. Um, you might need to use a real browser if your site has to use JS. Now, a better alternative might be to, to use CucumberJS to test your JS and not try and do everything end to end. But you need a real browser if you're going to run JavaScript. This is currently my setup for uh, running a real browser. I run Chrome. It now supports the headless flag. Makes it, that makes it about twice as fast. It doesn't pop up. Um, but only on certain scenarios. The scenarios that are tagged as these need to have JavaScript. They need to be verified right the way through the web server. It's OK. There's only a few of them. They're very, very slow. Things I'm looking at at the moment, this person here has written an extension that drives Chrome directly and doesn't use Selenium. So you run Chrome as a server, and it talks to the Chrome debug socket, and it's about twice as fast. Um, so in summary, start, try out driving domain models directly. It'll help you with your naming. It'll help, uh, help mature that domain model. Try testing at the service layer when you think you've got a, 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 a mature domain model. And if you do add UI coverage, add a small amount. That's it. Please do rate the talk. That's quite important. Um, this is me. I'm available for consulting, training, coaching, things like that. Um, I maintain a tool called PHP Spec. I look after a meetup called BDD London, and I help out with Symphony UK. So come along to those. And if you're interested in the code I've been showing, I've got a working version on GitHub. Kieran McNulty, BHAT Symphony Demo. Uh, there's no time for questions, but thank you very much.